Thank, thanks so much. Uh, it's, uh, it's both an incredible honor and also incredibly humbling to be addressing, A, addressing this audience in this room, and B, have, uh, have my uh, name pronounced somehow in the same sentence as Herman Wiles. So it's, uh, like I said, this is this very humbling. And uh, so today's lecture, uh, there will be no wild groups in today's lecture. My, uh, the, the, the goal of this lecture is just to introduce places where they will appear tomorrow. And uh, so it, for those of you who decided to come tomorrow. It's, it's a sequence of three lectures, if you, if you, if you. So we'll start with, uh, um, maybe I'll put a little bit here. So we'll, we'll uh, X, start with X, which will be smooth, quasi-projective. And threefold. What is important is threefold. And we can take it over C, it doesn't matter. But what's important here is, is I don't, I make no assumption on the canonical class of X. It's not Calabi-Yau. It's just an arbitrary thing. E.g., it's very interesting to study E.g. the plain, the plain old projective space is very interesting to study from this perspective. And the kind of question. So this is my picture of X. And the kind of question we'll be asking is how many curves. Oh, so the question is let's compute the number of curves. C of some degree d, d is an element in h to x, z, and genus g, where by genus we mean arithmetic genus, that is to say this would be uh, 1 minus the, the, the other characteristic of OC, such that, and you put some incident. Traditionally, put some incidence conditions. Like, for example, very, very classically, you may be interested in in the number of lines they meet in P3. That means four given lines. The, the structure shift. That's the, the the structure shift. The functions on that curve. So, um, and so we will be answering. We'll be asking and answering this question in. In not in more traditional neutral geometry, but instead in, in K theory, which is uh, which is which is more appropriate for the kind of things I'll, I'll explain to you. You'll see today to see why is it why is it makes a difference, and how we would compute it here. Well, <laughs> we look at the at the moduli space of such objects. Maybe call it M. So uh, say say we think of moduli space of lines. That is, we'll think of that Hilbert scheme of uh, Subskins, we'll be always looking at one dimensional subskin. So that's characterized by its degree. And degree here is just one, the generator of, of uh, the line, the generator of Kamalji group. And, uh, in the, in the, and so this line has a genus 0. Therefore, this, this, uh, this number is 1. So that's our moduli space. Is that everybody comfortable with that? And in this cross, the threefold itself, x, sits since the universal, the, it, 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 there's a universal subscheme here, universal line. So let me just say C twiddle, the universal line, universal subscheme. And if we would like to say, what is, what's, a, what's a condition for a, a curve to meet a line? Well, you look at the you look at the structure shift of that of that universal line, and you tensor it in, in K theory. You tensor it with the pullback from the second factor, I'll write P2 pullback of a class of a line. I'm not gonna bother. So these are these are those these are those lines here that meet given line here. And then we push it forward to the first factor, to the moduli space. This will be divisor in here that, that will consist of all lines meeting a given line. If we wanted to stack four such, well, we'll tensor them up. All the tensor products are in case here. From take four of them and compute the other characteristic. And of course, the number will be 2. 
The reason it's very easy to do this too, of course, geometrically otherwise, is of course that this is, in this particular instance, this, this moduli space, this particular moduli space is just a Grassmannian. A line in three space is the same as a two plane in, in four dimensional linear space, it's Grassmannian G24. What are you indexing? What? What are you indexing? For Grassmannian or for? Uh, for, for this? First goes the degree and then the weather characteristic. No. It's just the number of lines. There's, it would take four of them. Oh. Take four lines. We could have taken five, get zero. So, so, so then, uh, and what Grassmannians is what we show prospective graduate students, lest they know they're going on an exploration trip to a black hole, because even in degree one, so if so, even if I, even uh, even if in, even in this situation. If I change this one to some general number, let's put this, this number n, then the problem becomes essentially hopeless. And it's in that, in that the actual moduli space, you think, what's going to parameterize? An actual moduli space, in addition, to, in addition to the line itself, you'll get n minus 1 extra point. It can stick together and stick to the line in every possible way. It will be a very complicated thing. And if you're, if you're trying to compute any other characteristic of any sheaf on a space, you should ask yourself, the first question you, cannot, you should ask yourself, what do you know about that space? What are your, what are your hopes, to, what you're hoping to accomplish? And a very basic question is you don't even know the dimension. <coughs> Essentially, no, in no case is the dimension of the Hilbert space well, aside from the trivialities, is the dimension of the Hilbert scheme, actual dimension of the Hilbert scheme, no. It's not even, it's not even, not even, uh, not even for points in three, in, in, in linear three space. And so the reason is that, is that the, this, this problem about looking for a curve satisfying such and such condition, to begin with, just the moduli, just the, the mo just your moduli space M, is already, is already presents a certain excess intersection problem. Because if you naively count the parameters, you expect a dimension, expected <coughs> dimension of this moduli space of of curves of some degree d in some threefold. This independent of the other characteristic, and it comes out to the to the you, you dot the first churn class of x with that d. So would you say that about the silver screen again? So uh -huh. have, what is the, the first is the degree or the first goes the degree I mean the way I mean you can in, in, in general, before coefficient to the Hilbert parallels, but since we since we're looking for a one dimensional object with just two coefficients, first goes the degree and then goes well, essentially the genus so the, or the holomorphic oil characteristic. So here I put, here I put the holomorphic oil characteristic. Yeah. I'll index it like this. Yes, but this is for P3 is one dimensional. Oh, for P3. It's the generator, yeah. Right. And, and like I said, actual dimension, actual dimension even even for the Hilbert scheme of C three points this is this is this is hopeless. I mean hopeless with our current understanding. And 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 but this is this is this is this is this is okay in the numerative geometry it's okay. In numerative geometry people used to dealing with excess intersection problem. Right, you see, you just count things with appropriate multiplicities, and the way to do it here is if you think of the, you think of this moduli space, of whatever it parameterizes. If you think of its structure sheaf, just just the basic thing, just some complicated object. The way this they are constructed, this is this is typically like this Zierski homology, of some differential graded algebra. I'll write it something like this. Some you don't need to know what it is. Some DJ here, and of course, if you if you want to do correct K-theoretic counts, you should include them all. You should you should just 
you should just declare the virtual structure shift. I mean, like, like we always do. If it, so if this tensor product here, they're not tensor products of sheaves. They're tensor products in case here. You, you take the all tor groups with alternating coefficients. And same thing here. If you, you should take, uh, take them all. So it'll be summation over i a minus 1 to the i h i. And at least with this coffee, with this definition, this A makes, sen makes good sense. B is deformation invariant. Like one thing we always want in, in enumerative geometry is to have things deformation invariant. Of course, in algebraic geometry, you may have exactly opposite interest. You may want to look for three folds that, for some reason, have more curves than others. And this is, this is, this is a very legitimate question. But if, you're, if you want the, the numbers to be constant in deformation families, that, that will accomplish this. And so then you think, you think, well, if I stick even some such definition. So classes you get from the universal subscheme itself, those classes, we, we just broadly label them tautological. So something like so anything of this kind, we'll, we'll call them tautological. And then you'd think, well, maybe I'll just stick in. So I apologize. If you're taking your notes in, in pen, then that's hard. But it's, if you're doing it on a, c on a computer, you can just you know, copy and paste. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe I'll put this one guy here. And this is something you can certainly study, given that I've been studying this for years. But, but you can compute this function here. You can compute for in particular in this, in, this pr in this example. And you'll see you're getting something which is, how to say, I, I cannot say if you have a function, I don't know, I cannot somehow, I cannot substantiate the opinion that this is a garbage function. But, but it certainly doesn't, you can compute for yourself and see if it resonates, if you can find any properties of these numbers. And the reason is that you should, so this is a point, this is a point, I, I means perhaps it's a completely obvious point to, um, to our colleagues in the School of Natural Sciences, but to mathematicians, I think, in the present concept, it was first pointed out by Nekrasov. So who said? Who said that you shouldn't, you shouldn't take this object here. You shouldn't be thinking, so this is computing holomorphic color characteristic. Well, computing in differential geometric terms, this means computing the, the index of a d bar operator. And you shouldn't be, don't think about index, don't think about the index of the d bar operator, but take the Dirac operator instead. Which means, in this context, what would you like to do is you, You'd like to tensor it further with the square root so of the, so in the same way as you have a virtual, oh, you have a virtual tangent bundle, you have a virtual canonical, and you'd like to square, put the square root of the virtual canonical. So that, that, would, be a good, that would be a good definition. So this, this thing. This thing has a virtual tangent bundle. Means means that it's a bundle which is again a K-theory class alternating sum of vector bundles that you declare to be a tangent bundle, and of that you can take the determinant and take this, uh, try to take the square root of its dual. This would be this. And of course, the basic question was kind of the basic question before you get started is is, is why this thing exists. And it's, uh, it's one thing to, <laughs> and, uh, and the result in this, uh, the it was open for some time until, so something with, with, uh, with uh, so this is the something we've uh, proven with Nikita. We have a, okay, that's not so, okay. In a paper which, so in a paper such that has mostly conjectures, but there's, there's a few theorems, and that is a theorem. And says the following. So in general, in general, for a general threefold, the way the way I stated it here, in general the square root will not exist. But there is a way to fix that square root. And 
and and it's usually if you're you know if you're, if you're trying to fix a square root of a line bundle, you're going to get uh, a line bundle many choices for 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 the way to fix it. And the way to phrase it here is the following: that if I take if I take uh, take uh, an arbitrary line bundle, which I'll denote L4. 4 will be, you'll, uh, you'll now you understand why is it, why 4 is important. Defined, define L5 to be the canonical of x times L4 inverse. Then if I put, then in this formula, if I put in If in here I put a certain specific tautological class, namely I put the determinant of the cohomology, again I take my universal curve, I'll just denote it C, and take a, uh, or maybe I'll put OC, OC tensor. Here becomes the difference, L4 minus L5. Then this thing has a square root. So in particular, if your if your three fold was k trivial, then you can take both L4 and L5 equal to both trivial, and this term goes away. But in general, this is what you need to fix. Fix that square root. And the way to think about it is you should think of your so this will, will be coming coming back to this over and over. You should think of your so you had your three fold x which is pictured over there. Instead, you should be thinking about a fivefold, which is a total space of two line bundles over, over, over x. So there are two line bundles, which I'll denote L4 and L5. So the total space is a fivefold, which I'll denote z. And that total space, and this is now, now by my assumption, the canonical class of that z is trivial. This, of course, is, should be super familiar to Robert, because an algebraic fivefold is a real tenfold, and it want the, the string theorists want that to be canonical, that to be k-trivial, not, not the threefold, not the threefold itself. And so, and so now, what can you do with this? So now I've defined for you something. And what? And we've. And so yeah. This, so we're talking about arbitrary unified scheme, or it's still one end? Or, or, or arbitrary three. Now, arbitrary threefold arbitrary Hilbert scheme. Okay. One dimensional sub scheme, yeah. But you want to can be arbitrary, yeah. This could be anything, yeah. That, that's okay. That's okay because if we will be doing it in the current case here, it'll be this will be this will be set up so that if you have some automorphism with a proper fixed point set, then this makes sense. So in general, of course, for this to be to make sense, you have to have you have to take places somewhere, right? So for if 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 X is projective by itself, then this this thing is well defined. If it if it has an automorphism such that its its fixed point set is proper, then it's again well defined. Well, mathematicians also, representation theorists also know that the index of Dirac operators typically tend to have much more structure than the indices of the, the Dubar operator. It's, it's just a, I don't know. It, it's a diff. It, interpretation of, before you did this, there was yeah. an interpretation as, as counting things, but is there now an interpretation? Of it's still an interpretation, just you, um, I just say, this may be. Uh, or maybe I'll answer your question like this. This is a deeper question, which occasionally reduces to counting things. But this is, it's, it's better to study this question. It's, it, has a, it, has more, uh, uh, it has more relevance to the outside world, if I may say so, than, than actually, counting, than actually counting curves to. Uh. Like I said, you can, in principle, without this square root, you can also do it. This will be still not directly enumerative, because this thing is not. It's not, it's not really a structure shift. 
right? I mean, you, you think of your, if you think of particular, your th particular threefold may have more curves than the nearby threefold. Right? And so this will give you, this will give you a number which is constant in deformation families, right? So this will be not an actual number of curves on your threefold. Yeah. So, and this is also deformation invariant. It's just a different way to count. You have some moduli space, you have moduli problem, then, you, then it's a question, what do you associate? So suppose you already have some moduli space, you impose all your conditions, you have some space. And now, what would you like to associate to this? And, and one thing you say, I'm going to take the holomorphic order characteristic. The other thing says, well, I'm going to take the index of Dirac operator. Both, both things are legitimate. And, and the second thing gets better, gets better answers. So the, yeah. Oh, because if you have a Kähler manifold, then the Dirac, then Dirac operator, the Dirac uh, operators is going to be D bar acting on not on functions but on sections of square root. Okay. And then what, do you, what, what does this formula tell you in terms of Dirac and the index of the Dirac operator? It really is the index of some. In, in, if you think of this as a space of whatever, whatever some object, this really is the index of Dirac operator on that space. Yeah. To the extent, to the extent that this is makes sense in algebraic geometry, computes for you some object defined in infinite dimensional differential geometry. But it's it really <coughs> all right. So okay. So now what what uh, what uh, what can we compute with it? And so and so so now question makes like I said, question makes perfect sense. And it's best, so it's best to disentangle the way it's defined. It, it's actually best to, to take, it, it's clear geometrically that this, in the Hilbert scheme, we have, we have an actual curve and, and points that are allowed to just float around. And it's, it seems like a good idea to disentangle the two. To first, in other words, compute first the answer for just the points and then divide the answer for curves by the answer for the points. Points make no contribution to this, ex to this virtual dimension. Points just along for the ride. One can compute, make some computation for the points, and then try to take it out. Right, so this, is, this will make, make my li uh, our life easier. And so one can ask first the following question. So one can consider the following function. So now we do degree equals 0. And we define, and so it'd be so here, I'll with some I put some prefactor which I'm not going to tell you what it is. And so this times a certain prefactor, I will call the uh, O hat virtual. Hat refers to like an A roof genus, it's like the index of Dirac operator. And what will I put in this prefactor? I'll put so in my Hilbert scheme of endpoints, I'll put a certain variable minus z to the n. This way I can sum over, for fixed degree, I can sum over all number of points, and this will be a well-defined generating function. Okay. And so for degree z, so we can take the Euler characteristic of, again, I take the Hilbert scheme of uh, my x. Degree will be 0, and this will be arbitrary. So I'll just point star take the disjoint union over them all. I take that O hat virtual. As I just said, this includes a prefactor of this. And then uh, that means a, a generating function with this coefficient over all, over all possible number of points. And so then this was, so this was uh, in the same paper where Nekrasov wrote about that. He made a conjecture. Uh, so this conjecture by Nekrasov, and it's, it's a theorem now. Uh, which is, you know, kind of comes out of the whole thing. So I'll just state it here. Uh, that this is, so what this thing, so many, many times today we'll see, we'll see some, some object. So this is, this, what is this? This is, so the way we will think about this, that this is a virtual representation of a group which is the automorphisms of x cross. And now we'll do something of the following kind. 
will declare this, this variable z to be an element in a multiplicative group. We'll just introduce a new, a new C star with which the variable is z. And that this, this just says that my space is graded and the, the one, the number of points is the weight by which this guy acts. And so in this sense, this is a virtual representation of this object, this will be a symmetric algebra of a certain other representation, we'll just for now denote maybe star. <coughs> so, so if I have a representation of a group, then, it's, then the group also acts in the symmetric algebra. Even if it is the case that the, this representation here is uh, positively graded with respect to some element of the group, such as this one, this will be the case, then also the symmetric algebra is well defined in the sense even if this guy is infinite dimensional. If this positively graded with finite dimensional weight components, then means, you know, the symmetric algebra is Fox space, right? So if you have a, if you have a you have some energy level in one particle system, and then, then, then this infinite you take an arbitrary thing, this will still has well defined, this has still well defined, this, this is still well defined. And what this thing is, so what's that star? That star is, I have to take my notes, since I only remember the second line of the formula, not the first, even though uh, I know proof, uh, it doesn't mean I know the formula. It's, it's something associated to X itself. So you take, you take the Euler characteristic on X itself of, uh, of Z times L4. Here comes the tangent bundle plus the canonical minus the dual of the tangent bundle minus the dual of the canonical divided by 1 minus Z times L4. 1 minus z times L5 inverse. Right. So this is, if you expand this out in, in, in power of z, you're going to get a well-defined k-theory class on x, so which you take the Euler characteristic. This will give you a, a graded vector space, which you plug in here, you're going to get this. But uh, there's a better way to say it, is that you can say, you see, how do you get this? How do you get this? Uh, how do you get the not denominators like this? What does it mean? This means this means the weight of how do you get denominators? Denominators in 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 K theory, you get from just polynomial algebras, right? If you think of polynomials in in uh, n variables, you take the character of that. This would be one over product one minus the weights of the generators. So this this here looks like the character of functions on the fiber of my, of my line bundle, right? Because these are the line bundles, and they twist it, they twist it so that, so that this, the variable z acts on this one with weight 1, and on this one with, that, with the opposite weight. Okay. That's there. So if I divide through by this, I'm going to get exactly the inverses of the weights of the two coordinates. And this says I'm just getting. I'm just, this thing naturally is an Euler characteristic on the fivefold, not on the, not on the threefold. So have I lost everybody? All right, ask some questions, so let's see if I, so. So the question, so maybe before I say this, so if I take, so if I take, you know, C3 and make it, and make variables with you know, t1, t2, t3 act on here. And I'd like to compute the Euler characteristic of functions. So this is polynomials on this space. What's it going to be? It's going to be 1 over 1 minus t1 inverse. These are the weights of the coordinates. 1 minus t2 inverse, 1 minus t3 inverse. Right. Everybody agrees with that? These are the character of the polynomial ring. And if if this, if I have a, a, a bundle, then the, the corresponding to this things, will, which is the sum of line bundles, then the corresponding to this will be, this will be the, this the, this would be that bundles, you know, those, those line bundles sitting there. So I didn't. So maybe I'll finish the formula, 
And the formula says that this is the Euler, essentially the Euler characteristic of on the variable z, t, the, the cotangent bundle of z minus the tangent bundle of z. And I'll tell you the interpretation of this formula in a second. But, uh, but, uh, but before I'll tell you, maybe I'll take a, a question. What was the question? Before this. Uh -huh. It's symmetric algebra of. So if a representation, you can take it symmetric algebra of. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you an example in a second of this formula. Maybe we'll start with an example. So what's an example? An example is I take, I take x to be c3 itself. Then, then, then this is the maximal torus in the automorphism groups of this. Okay. And so my variables take, I take, I get something with functions in t1, t2, and t3, because uh, I'm computing an equivariant k theory. That is to say, I compute the traces of some, such some matrix on, on some cohomology of some stuff. Right. And so, so I get something complicated. But I can specialize this t1, t2. If I specialize this t1, t2, t3 to, to, to multiply to 1, then I get the following formula, which is classical. It says, it says the sum, so you, you can show, then you get on one side, you get summation over n. You get just the topological Euler characteristic of the Hilbert scheme of C3 endpoints, which, which, which you can see directly is the number. So if you think in what is the, 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 the topological order characteristic of, of, of the space, it's just the number of three-dimensional partition of that number, n. So it's like summation over 3D partitions. Really, I mean, it's hard to say. I'll draw you a two-dimensional partition. And then you can imagine what the three-dimensional partition is. So the number of 3D partitions pi, z to the size of pi, because this is the, this is the generating function for the number of three-dimensional partitions, that this is this guy. So maybe z to the n, I apologize. Then this, that formula says that this is the symmetric algebra. Once this, the, the dust settles, you're going to get z over 1 minus z square. It's clear that it's not inconceivable that this formula will specialize to just z over 1 minus z square. Right? What is this? This, this if, you, if you expand this out, this is, of course, 1, sorry, z, 0. <laughs> 0 plus z plus 2z square plus 3z cubed and so forth. So in each gradient and gradient n, you get number n. Right? And so the symmetric algebra of that, if you take, so what, what's it going to be? It's going to be a product. You have one generator of degree 1, two generators of degree 2, three generators of degree 3. And so it's going to be a product over n, 1 over 1 minus z to the n, the whole thing to the n. Which is, of course, this is, this is a famous identity due to McMahon. And this is and this is some really really souped up generalization of it. That that makes sense. Sorry, but maybe a question at this point or. No, no, this is a character. So you think of z as an element in a group, and that's written a character here, right? This is, this is written, this is a z, z is a sits in some element in some group. And what you have is, have is representation. And this is a character of that representation. That character says you have, you have weight n with multiplicity n. For this? 
oh, that's very easy. This is because the, the set of this is a set, set of three commuting matrices. And three commuting matrices is a critical set of the function x, commutator, y, z, trace of that. This is a critical set of, this is a critical point of that. So this is very easy. So you just write the, in general, it's, you know, slightly. So for Columbia Yard, it's all kind of collapses. Yeah, they all collapses, yeah. Right? Does that make sense? So now we're going to divide out. This is, so this was, this was just, just to say by what we're going to divide out. And, and we will also, so that was nice, but this is not, this is not what this lecture is going to be about. Well, I don't know. You'll be the judge whether this is nice or not. But uh, so now there is a way to there's a way to incorporate all incidence condition once and for all, and namely do is the fall is the fall where my now? So, uh, so I'm going to do two, two things. I'm going to first get rid of all incidence conditions once and for all, and that I will do the following. I'll consider there's a map from the Hilbert scheme to the Chow variety, which is just parameterized just cycles of a given, of a given degree. And forgets, forgets everything, forgets the Euler characteristic, forgets whole things. So, but it does remember the incidence conditions. So I'll take the, this push forward for the Hilbert scheme to the Chow of my uh, of that uh, of this shape. So this will be now a shift on the Chow variety that still remembers the incidence condition, forgets everything about the genus of the curve or the other characteristic of the structure sheet. And so now it makes sense since I've since all possible point, I mean all possible you know, like number of points, all possible genes, everything got collapsed under this map. I can now divide divide out by what we computed in degree zero <coughs> by the result. degree. All that stuff, all these points, they all disappear in this map. Okay? So this is an object, so where this sits, this is now an element in the current K, again, in the current maybe out X a current K theory of the Chow variety. It's a series in Z with this with the uh, with elements here. And so now about this series, there are two conjectures. So one, in general, it's a conjecture. I'll explain why it's still a conjecture. Does this thing is, in fact, a rational function? Offset. So we, we divide it out by some transcendental thing. It's an infinite product, so kind of like this. But the result is then contains, I mean, kind of makes sense. There's some, in, in fixed degree, there's only so many geometric information. So it, it makes sense that this, this, there's finitely many information in this data. But this is a very sharp way of saying that this is a rational function. With, in fact, with specific denominators, we'll get to that. And on the other hand, this is, this is and so this is, this is, they're both not big conjectures. I'll explain why, is it, why it's not a big conjecture. But this, is, this is the same, so it's still a conjecture. And uh, well, I'll explain why it's, this is still a conjecture. Is that this is the same if I instead, instead from pushing forward from the Hilbert scheme, I push forward from a different, from a diff so there's a whole bunch of different ways you can parameterize a curve. And one of this is this binary upon the Thomas space, or, this, or the stable pair space. So you push forward, push forward this guy. So this is sorry, push forward, push forward that of that O virtual. And and 
And, and what is this thing? So the Hilbert scheme, one way to say what Hilbert scheme parameterizes, parameterizes the following thing. It parameterizes quotients of the structure G for your threefold. So that is to say you parameterize, uh, you, have a, you have a map to the structure sheaf of your, you have functions on your curve, they are quotients of all functions on your threefold. That is to say you have a map, a surjective map, like this. And what this space does, it, 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 so this is, this is really arbitrary one-dimensional thing. And what this thing does, it allows, it, 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 just, it just parameterizes complexes of very similar kind, but slightly different. So namely, this guy can have, like this fungus, this guy can have points. This guy can have torsion, right? This is, this is something, sorry, this is going to have zero-dimensional subsheets. And so what you instead you do, you, you, you now allow co-kernel. OK, this is technical. But it's a useful space to have in mind if you Sorry. This is, I shouldn't say this. Because the whole subject is like uh, northern territories. There's, it's a vast land, and very few Inuits uh, to somehow who, uh, who all each know each other and uh, you know, occasionally see each other at conferences. The, and so the chances of anybody, you know, like a new indigenous person settling in the area are kind of small. But if, in any, if in the, on the other side chance somebody wants to work in, this, in the area, this is a very nice space. And it's characterized by the fact that you allow co-kernel. But, this, but at, the, at, at the price that this is now, this is now pure one dimensional. And this is now zero dimensional. So whatever, whatever zero-dimensional stuff you had here, you now move to the co-kernel. Like for example, in particular, it's not allowed, you cannot just have an extra point floating around. And this, this, you know, this part checks out kind of, you know, you know, checks out in the generation. So this is okay. In the generalities, in the generalities we will discuss in this lecture, for those three folds, this part is okay. It's not for, I mean, I'll, I'll say some results which are, under some hypothesis, and that this, this part, this, but this part is OK. The reason that this is not known, this is known for Kalabi Yao. And in general, I think the exact same, more or less exact same, this is a wall crossing type of question. And more or less the exact same, same argument should prove it in general, but it's just nobody's working on this. I mean, it's, like, it's hard enough people to study, convince people to study Kalabi Yao's. And uh, for Kalabi Yao's, this is OK. But like, uh, yeah. Well, I guess I gave you, I gave away the fact that there's a not all moduli space for Grassmannians, and most of them look like a black hole. So its chances of attracting you to work on the subject are kind of nil. But uh, but anyway, this is this is. So I think this is uh, modulus. Somebody actually doing the work here. This would be this would be fine. And so and so then the question becomes: Well, how about how we should think of this rational function? So there are two, there are two natural questions. So there are two natural functions. How to think? So the maybe, maybe the first question. How to think about this rational function? And the second question is how to compute it. And, um, and I'll start with the first, especially. And so now I have to, in, in Russian language, there is no difference between while and they. <laughs> so uh, both, of course, extremely distinguished members of the faculty of, uh, of this institute. And, 
And this lecture is about vial groups. However, what I'm going to say now has, I mean, anybody who hears about this being a rational function with more or less in controllable denominators, of course, instantly thinks vague conjectures. And, uh, and, and what I'm going to hear, what I'm going to tell now has some, some, it's not, it's nothing like vague conjectures, but has something of the kind. Namely, it again will be, of course, it's not going to be Frobenius acting, but it will be some, this group, this group here, actually geometrically acting, will tell you what that, what that rational function is. So the spirit of the conjecture will be very close to this. So there'll be some space on which this group actually geometrically acts. And this will be a finitely generated module over a finitely generated algebra. And therefore, its character will be a rational function over this guy. Right, so this is, this is, this is. And so the, so the, the, the answer to question number one, what, uh, what is being proposed? So this is in our paper with Nikita. Is that the following? So we look for, so there'll be some, uh, a moduli space, which I'll, uh, I'll denote M2 of Z. Be better if I copy my, you have my notes here. Which I'll define, you, define for you in a second. With a map, so this is, remi remember Z was this total space Total space of two line bundles, a five fold total space of two line bundles over my three fold. With, so this will have a map similar to the Hilbert to Chow map. This will have a map, so if, if I have a, this parameterizes, again, parameterizes curves in that five fold. If you have a, if you have a curve and five fold has a cycle, I can vision push it forward to x. Right? So this will have a map to the Chow of x. And so then, then the conjecture would be so this is a conjecture. This is, in a, in a way, similar to the statement of that theorem, is that this push forward, this push forward, this yellow push forward, is again symmetric algebra, in a sense that I'll explain in a second, of the corresponding push forward from here, from this M2 to Chow of a certain O, where. Where this now, now, now on this space, my group C star with this element that really acts. So it's a really, this, this guy, the same way it's, it was acting here. Here, here this object really, it's, it's, a, it's a space on which a group acts. And so therefore, if we take a, if we take a you know, shift, it's a representation of that group. So then, then, then I take symmetric algebra first as a, as a representation of that group. And also, And also, when we take that symmetric algebra, first S module, and also using the addition map. So when you take when you have a sheaf on some variety, that the variety is a semigroup, you can take symmetric algebra using that addition map. Namely, you push forward your sheaf under the addition map, and then you take the S invariance. That's, that's what it means. Right, so this is, what does it mean to take a, is that, is that, is that clear? We have some sheaf on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on variety. If I take an n-fold product, I'm going to get exterior thing. I push it forward under the addition, and I take S invariance. So this is what this means. The so geometrically just means I've uh, this extract kind of this 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 gives you kind of disconnected. If you, if you think of all Feynman diagrams, this gives you all the Feynman diagrams and just gives just the connected time. Okay. Um, all right. So example. This is an example in which is like a theorem. Is the following. So what if you 
it's, it's immaterial. It's best, actually, it's best to define as the image of the Hilbert scheme. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I don't know, Janusz may disagree. It's, uh, but I think I like it better when just defined as the image of the Hilbert scheme. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so example. So let, take at the following. So this is, I remind you, this is what my picture of my x. And then it's, uh, it sits inside z with this L4 and 5. And now I'll take a smooth, reduced curve in x. And I take the, you know, the best, possible, best possible curve, c. And I take at the corresponding point in chow. So that what are the PT spaces that sit over that? So you're looking at you're looking at a sheaf on that curve with a section. A sheaf on that curve is a section, it's just the same as, as a bunch of points. Because that you know sheaf of the section means divisor. The curve kernel of the section is a divisor. Right? So the, my PT spaces is just this joint union over all n symmetric power of my curve. And that O virtual hat, it has some, some features like, you know, it's like z to the n, but most importantly, it has some bundle which it looks like something like exterior algebra of what, of the cohomology. So a point here, a point in this space is a divisor. And so then, right, so the divisor of degree n my curve, and so I can take the following bundle. I take the cohomology of that, uh, of that tends to the determinant of the normal bundle to x in C. <coughs> so this would be, so my curve, the smooth curve in x has a normal bundle. Take the determinant of that, take the cohomology, and I take exterior algebra of that. This will be, this will be more or less this thing. So And so now I'm looking for, and now I'm looking for the summation over n minus z to the n times the cohomology, or maybe the Euler characteristic of over this n sixth symmetric power of c of that O virtual. And 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 what am I supposed to get? I'm supposed to get that something which just has to do with this curve, with this curve moving in the two transverse directions. Right? My, my only, from the point of view of five-fold geometry, the only, the only geometry I have is this curve can, can try to move in the, in the fourth and fifth direction. And so then we'll say that this is in fact, so this will be that symmetric algebra, that's this S dot here. And then will be the cohomology of the curve C itself. And then I take z l4 plus z inverse l5 dual. Right, this is just 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 says just just said I this are this is how the curve is allowed to move in the fourth and the fifth direction, and this is just pl just polynomials of that. These are just this is just coordinate this is just coordinate algebra of the space in which of that of that virtual space. And, and this is, what is the specialized is too? Again, it's like, if, if, like another, another Mike Mann-like specialization. What this thing is going to specialize to? This thing specialized to, what if x is Calabi Yao? So if x, if, if kx, if kx is, so that, that specialization to Calabi Yao specialization found McMahon, McMahon, if, it, if we make this assumption, this becomes, a formula of McDonald's for the Hodge numbers of uh, symmetric power of, of this would be this this number this would be the cotangent bundles of 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 this th of this space will be the cotangent ex exterior algebra of the cotangent bundle, and so here you're computing the Hodge numbers of symmetric of symmetric uh, power of a, of a curve, 
And so then the McDonald says that factors nicely, and the factors nicely exactly this way. You can take, in this situation, you can take L4 and 5 to be trivial, and you're going you're to get it. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. And still is, yeah. The still so the I mean now I'm I'm uh, now we're talking about just uh uh now we're talking about the Ukrainian K theory of point with respect to this this group. Z. I just took a fiber over some. I took in the child variety, I took one particular point. And I'm comparing the fibers of this of these two things over it. Yeah, and so it'll just it's just two representations of a certain group. But in fact, it over the whole this thing is canonical. And it's, it's over the whole, over the whole, uh, over the whole locus in Chow in which my cycle is uh, is uh, reduced smooth curve. I have in effect an actual equality of the. This is an actual equality over that whole locus. Okay. More questions. All right, so now I had some program for this lecture, which we more or less accomplished, except so there are two, two items. Two items I, I, uh, I was planning to say. And uh, one is, what is this moduli space? And I think we better skip it. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can read the paper. <laughs> but so <laughs> The second thing is to address the second fascist, how one actually goes about computing, computing, computing this function. And this is, um, this is the usual, there is one extremely powerful move, and that's what you can do. So, so far we were talking about some, something which is associated to algebraic threefold, algebraic quasi-projective threefold, of course, extremely general. Yeah. So what do I know about our quasi-projective threefold? Nothing, right. except, except especially in, in the company, of, in the present company, it was just like, just really, really small amount. But there is one move that allows you to go from a very, very general threefold to something very specific, it's like taking it's like in, you know, yeah, like, like in Chern Simon's theory. You're allowed to take a very general real threefold, which you know, I don't know, some people know a lot about, but I certainly don't, but, and then break it in certain pieces for which you, the pieces you understand, and then you can glue, glue the answers back together. The analog of this in algebraic geometry is you can consider a situation when, when your threefold degenerates to a union of two along a smooth divisor. So maybe you have a union x1, x2, union along a smooth divisor d. And it could be the case that your threefold is in fact, in fact, so maybe I'll have a different color of chalk. Your original threefold x, in fact, degenerates to something like this. Right? So no singularity on the divisor. No, it's like so. So the the, the 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 normal picture is just is just x y equals epsilon, right? I mean, along the divisor, you just have that degeneration. Yeah. So wait, wait. So, so first, so there are two pieces of good news. First, there's a whole yoga. Yoga about gluing, gluing curve counts in x from those in x1 and x2. So this, it's not, it's not, it's not immediately clear how to do it, but 
there, it's, there, is, there is a way to do it. And it's, it's very complicated subject, which is maybe, I mean, there's lots of people working on the, the few names I want to write down, maybe Jun Lee. And then, uh, of course, uh, Pandey, Pandey, and Pixton. And, and I'll put my own student name Smirnov because he actually figured out the exact change of variables one needs to, one needs to, one needs to do. There's some, there's many people, many people work on this. So this is one piece of good news. And second piece of good news is the theorem of, again, Levine and Panhir Pande. But may I be forgiven for not, I mean, not writing the name of my dearest friend in full. <laughs> they prove the following fact. They prove that if, if in the free abelian group generated by varieties x, I pass through the following equivalence relation that x is equivalent to x1 plus x2 minus the projectivization of O plus the normal bundle over the divisor, it doesn't matter, you take the normal bundle in either of them, it's the same thing. That this equivalence relation is equal, is then you get the algebraic homomorphism. Which is generated by projective spaces. So in particular, in three dimensions, the only three, so you think it's you, you think it's extremely hard, but in fact, it's, it's the whole, you get the whole thing down to toric varieties. So it's, in three dimensions, it's only three, three such things. So it says that, that that's clear. There is some gluing procedure that gets you down here. But in fact, instead of studying toric varieties, it's better. So what we will do in these lectures, instead of toric varieties, we'll do closely related things. You can take any any basis you want. So closely related thing, we will take x to be to be threefold fiber in just a n surfaces. They are, they are the, the, the simplest possible surfaces. A n surfaces over some smooth curve B. Where this A and this is resolution or minimal resolution of x, y equals z to the n plus 1. And in fact, it's enough to take, so, so including a0, which is just c2. So in fact, it's enough to take a0, a1, and a2, but it's, we might as well take all of them. And so this, this very specific set of curve counting problems contains the exact same information as the general thing, modulo your ability to break your your, your, your threefold in spaces. And so we will do, we will do this. And this where the, so, and this, there, there, this is where the wild group will appear. Wow. Wild groups, I mean, it's not groups, there's some kind of group points. If you, if you, if you want to, kind of wild group, like UH4 of GL n plus one hat hat. <laughs> So this is just as, just as to, this is the news of full disclosure. This is going to be complicated thing. But uh, the, 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 the original problem is complicated. These are complex, these are really, there's actual complexity in the problem. So it's not, so this, the, of course, the best way to convey you the level of the complexity in the problem is to have you, have people do homework. Compute the simplest, simplest possible examples of this sort of things and see how, how hairy objects these things are. And it's, you, think, you think that computing push forwards like this seems like, a, seems like a very, very particular kind of problem in mathematics. But in fact, <laughs> it's a little bit frightening. This, it's one of those problems which I think, so in mathematics, I think there are finally many problems that, 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 that contain like a sensible percentage of all mathematical knowledge. Certainly I've, uh, certainly I've discovered, like I said, it's, it's frightening. I've discovered, that I'm not claiming to know a lot of math, but whatever I know, I've discovered has direct relevance to, to, doing, to doing one or one or the other computation like this. Well, I'm over by five minutes, so I better stop. <laughs>